All right. We have the return of Scott Wheeler to the Winged Wheel podcast. It's been a few months, um, and that's not just counting the two draft days. Scott, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. Uh, Scott Wheeler, uh, you're getting pretty close to being the uh, you know resident or, or visiting draft expert for the Winged Wheel podcast, <laughs> but it's, it's a blast talking to you. Um, Scott does excellent work on The Athletic, um, did amazing work leading up to the draft and covering it, uh, and we'll get to that later. Uh, but for now, we are here to inundate you with all questions draft. So uh, as we understand it, this is just about your last obligation before taking some vacation. Yep, this is it. I'm I'm tying up my top 50 drafted prospects ranking and top 10 drafted goalie prospects ranking, which I release every summer, but I'm deciding to do an update on this year for a rare change just because, well, now that we've got all of these drafted kids to to reconsider. So released it in July, but there's a big update coming to it next week. And once I tie up the loose ends on that, I'm going to enjoy the free agency broadcast today and kind of call it a week. I've got all of next week booked off for vacation. Well, uh, Brad and I can never complain about being tired again. Uh, and with that, I'll throw to Brad. <laughs> All right. So to just uh, we'll, we'll throw up the softball to start. Um, I don't know if it, I want to say it was to anybody's surprise, but obviously the Detroit Red Wings took Lucas Raymond fourth overall. Just give us your general thoughts on what should be a hopefully franchise changing pick for the Red Wings. Yeah, I liked it. It was one of those picks where he was in the among the two or three players that I would have considered there. I probably would have also considered Cole Perfetti and Marco Rossi, but he was right in that mix. He was fifth on my board. They took him fourth. I've said all along that the kind of three to seven, three to eight tier for me was extremely tight. So I wasn't too fussed about what kind of order they went in. And, and Raymond was firmly in that. He was firmly in that group and that mix for me. So um, I think it's a great pick. I, I think he's the kind of player who can do things that virtually no one else in their organization can do. They, Anthony Mantha has his own skill set, and Dylan Larkin has his own skill set, and Philip Zadina has his own skill set, and none of them really remind you of the kind of play style that Raymond brings. So he's going to offer them something unique. He's going to give them a little bit of a different element in terms of creativity and just his ingenuity when he's on the ice in terms of his ability to navigate through pressure and navigate through feet and shade away from opponents to hang onto the puck and all of those things are, are, are certainly qualities that, that, they, that they need. They need someone who can have the puck on his stick, who can run the power play, who can create in the offensive zone. And I don't think he's going to be a hugely dynamic transition player. He, he doesn't have the speed of a Tim Stoitzle or even the, sort of the, the ability to play with pace through the middle of the ice like someone like Quinton Byfield. I don't think he has the rush sort of dyna, dynamism to his game that a player like Cole Perfetti does, even though I'd say he's a better skater than Cole Perfetti. Um, but his ability within the offensive zone to play in traffic, to play in tight spaces, to hang on to the puck, and then to create both for his line mates. And more recently, it's been nice to see with his own shot as an individual creator a little bit and to see him sort of let it rip a little bit more. All of that has has sort of been been a positive development for him and and the rest has always been there the the ability to just make every single play that that you'd expect him to make has always been there so he, he's going to be a lot of fun to watch I think there's a little bit more risk in his projection than some of those other kids um, just because of the style that he plays and the fact that he may require that the right kind of line mates to really hit the top of his ceiling but but I think in the right situation with talented players at the top of the lineup and with a ton of touches on the power play you're going to be really happy with that pick. So I'm glad you mentioned projection there and him being riskier and thus harder to project. And that's exactly what I'm going to ask you to do here because it's always damn near impossible to quantify players before the draft because uh, is this guy a first line player? Is this guy a second line player? Well, who's on the first line of the team that he's getting drafted to, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So now that we know Lucas Raymond is a Red Wing, we know what the Red Wings roster looks like and what their farm system looks like. Where do you see this guy projecting in the lineup, assuming he hits relatively close to his ceiling? Well, I think he'll spend this entire season in, in the SHL, as he should. And then you kind of go from there. If he has the kind of season where he's a sort of 0. 0.7 point per game player, he's a consistent contributor. Um, I'm, I'm not expecting him to go out there and have the kind of seasons that we've seen players like Elias Pettersson and William Nylander have after their draft years, where they were just arguably the one of the best players in, in Sweden professionally. 
Um, I think he will be a tiny little bit slower than that in terms of really grabbing hold of a dominant offensive role in, in the SHL. He's already playing bigger minutes this year. He's playing on the power play. He's playing higher in the lineup than he was a season ago. Um, so that's all been good to see. Uh, the ne- then after that, it, it's going to be tricky. I, I, I think he's not going to be the kind of player that steps right in and is is in the Calder Trophy conversation. Like I don't think he's going to be the kind of kid who in his very first season is putting up 60 points. I think it will be a little bit of a slower burn, and it's going to be incumbent on the Detroit Red Wings, the fan base, the pressure, the media, everyone involved to kind of recognize that because I think you could see some of the players who are taken around him having a more immediate impact. You could see Marco Rossi in the Western Conference being a, a sort of first or second line center for that Minnesota Wild team and playing with Kevin Fiala and playing with Kirill Kaprizov. And you could see, obviously, Quinton Byfield and Tim Stutzla and even Cole Perfetti in Winnipeg having a more immediate impact. But I, I think you've got to play the long game with with Lucas. And as far as his absolute ceiling, I think you expect him in time to play on the top line, whether that Dylan Larkin is still your sort of top line driver or not. Uh, you could see him playing with Dylan Larkin in two or three years. You could see him sort of being that go-to guy in in more of a way than players like Philip Zadina are capable of being. So um, that's the exciting factor. That's the, the, the sort of that Mitch Marner, that Kyle Connor, that that's the kind of player you're hoping he becomes is, is that sort of dominant play driving puck carrying winger who can control play when he's on the ice and have everybody else kind of bend to his will, if you will. So that's what you're hoping for long-term. I think it will probably take him two or three years in the NHL to kind of really come into his own. But once he hits that ceiling, once he gets a little bit stronger, once he gets comfortable making those plays and he learns to be as aggressive as a shooter as he always has been as a passer and as a puck pursuit guy, I think that's when you'll see him really come into his own and potentially become that kind of 70 to 80 point player. Now, Scott, I'm glad you mentioned Marco Rossi because obviously you are among the first and maybe only uh, among the only group to have um, him ranked third, I believe, on your list. Uh, and so to see him fall to ninth and to see Perfetti fall to tenth and, and yeah. having them go below guys like Alex Holtz at seven, what did you make of that? And what teams do you feel like made away uh, the best and what teams do you feel um, maybe took a bigger risk than they should have by passing on them? Well, I think that those were my two favorite picks of the first round and maybe of of the draft just because of their talent and and the value that they might be able to give you relative to where they were selected. I think both of those kids in some other recent drafts are locks to go in the top five, could go sort of second or third overall in a couple of drafts. Uh, Cole Perfetti in particular, I actually expected he would go ahead of Marco Rossi. So um, both of those kids are just, I think they're going to be bonafide stars in the league. Perfetti in a sort of very sort of dynamic offensive sense and Rossi as just one of the better two-way players down the middle in the league and the kind of player who can sort of be a dominant face-off guy and play late zone situations and play on your penalty kill and be kind of that that selkie type for you um so those were those were huge picks I certainly think as much as I love Jack Quinn I think Jack Quinn's a fabulous player he was sort of 13th, 14th, 15th on my board all year. I felt like that was a reach at eight uh, to the Buffalo Sabres, despite the fact that I do recognize and I do understand that with Jack Eichel and Dylan Cousins, that they like where they're at at, at center ice and they wanted to, to find a goal scoring winger to play with one of those kids. So I get that side of it. But even still, he w- Quinn wouldn't have been my pick there. And, and frankly, I think Cole Perfetti is a, a better fit to play on the wing and score a, a ton of goals. So, um, We'll see. It, it, that was really the the first head scratcher of the day for me. And there were others. I didn't love um, the, the sort of Caden Gooley pick to Montreal at 16. I didn't love the New York Rangers moving up to take Braden Schneider. I had kind of said, as I did radio and, prod, and, pod, and these podcasts before the draft, that the one thing that, that felt predictable this year was in a draft that's white on defensemen, inevitably a team was going to sort of take that more at cider swing, take that Philip Broberg swing and, and maybe take a player a little bit too high for my liking as good as more at cider is. And I'm sure we can get into him as well. But um, 
it, it just felt like those two D picks, and they were the consensus third and fourth D that, that should have gone off the board, were a little too high for me. And frankly, I thought that the Jake Sanderson pick to Ottawa at five was a little too high for me as well. Sanderson's a, going to be a fabulous player. He's an excellent defender. He's a superb skater. He's extremely athletic. All of those things are true of his game. But I think Ottawa was in a position to really swing on talent up front. They've already got Eric Brandstrom and Lassie Thompson and Jacob Bernard Docker coming to help support Thomas Shabbat, who's already a top pairing defenseman. And I think as good as Brady Kachuk and Drake Batherson and their other young forwards are, they could have added more than Tim Stutzler and really made a run of it. And I would have liked to have seen them go after a Rossi or a Perfetti instead of a Sanderson. So though, there, there were a few head scratchers in the first round, but ultimately I, I don't think it had a ton of shockers for me. I, I mean, Igor Chinakov to, to Columbus rocked my world. Um, but I think that was true of, of virtually everyone in the hockey world. So um, he was probably the only completely, completely off the board pick. So what you're saying is Shakir Mukamadoulin was a surefire first round pick. <laughs> well, Shakir, yeah, Shakir was a bit of a reach. I, I'm, I'm quite frankly, I am much higher on Shakir than most in the in the public sphere. I, I think that there has been a ton of hyperbole out there about people who maybe saw him play poorly once or uh, that kind of a thing. He was bad at the World Junior A Challenge when there were a lot of eyeballs on him, and that shaped a lot of opinions on his game, especially in in the sort of final where he basically gave up the the losing goal etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's Shakir's uh, I wouldn't have taken him 20th overall for sure he was another one of those defensemen who went too high but if he had have gone in the second round I think that was a fine range for him and he has been excellent in the KHL to start the season and playing in a leading role and some of that is due to COVID and, and the fact that those teams have suddenly gotten very young as a lot of their older players have contracted the virus but Shakir hasn't looked out of place in the KHL as a teenager, and he can skate for a kid who's massive. So there's at least some raw qualities to Shakir that I think you can work with, whereas a player like Igor to Columbus in the 20s, uh, I don't know. He looks like a depth piece for me. He looks like a depth prospect for me. He wasn't even in my top 100. Um, and though he was in consideration for my top 100, he's the kind of player who I wouldn't have used more than a third or fourth round pick on. All right, so jumping back into the Red Wings, and we'll jump into round two here, where the Red Wings made their three picks of Wallander, Niederbach, and Cross Hannes. Mm -hmm. The the feeling I've got reading your work and a lot of other people's work since the draft is uh, most people universally liked the Red Wings second round, uh, despite them almost never picking whoever everyone thought would have been their best player at the pick. So what was your feel? on the Red Wings second round? Well, I really like the the Wallander pick. Um, again, you're sure there might have been two or three other players in the conversation for me at that pick, but he was in that conversation. And anytime you're in the conversation it, it, as, as one of the best players available at that slot, I'm not honestly too fussed about it just because it's, it, that that's what happens at the draft. It's it's not always going to be BPA, BPA, BPA. If, if it were, then I wouldn't have to do the analysis that I do. So Wallander was a good pick in that range. He's a kid who honestly <laughs> reminded me a lot of the anti Tuomisto pick last year, and not because they're they're similar in skill sets, but because they're similar in the kind of prospect they are. Tuomisto was a kid who did a couple of things really, really well. He was huge. And you, you hope that you can work with the rest and that you can turn him into a legitimate option for you. And if you can, because he's huge and because he does a couple of things at a sort of A level, then suddenly if you can get the rest of his game to the proper heights, then he becomes, instead of a third pairing option, maybe he becomes a second pairing guy for you. And I think Wallander has always fit into that same group. There's a raw quality to his game, but his ability to skate, his, his length, his size... And the fact that he's actually got a decent amount of talent within the offensive zone once he does do all of that skating to get there, that's an exciting package. It's it's a it's a similar package to the way that Caden Gooley has been described in this draft class. And Gooley is certainly a much meaner player and I think also an even better skater than Wallander. But Wallander's uh, – he's an athletic, sort of raw, talented kid who's got size. And I think that's the kind of cut that, that I'm comfortable with a team making in the sort of – second, third round. And it's the kind of cut that I think is could prove fruitful in, in the Tuomisto pick as well. So I like both of those kids. And I think even if one of them makes it, that's a successful sort of gamble on those two players. Um, after that, it, 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 it's more of a mixed bag for me. I think Niederbach is a fine pick. 
Um, I would like to see him play a little bit more aggressively. There are times where he just, he looks passive out there, especially at the pro level. He looks like he's not comfortable making the kind of plays that he makes in, in super elite where he's a dominant player. And there have just been a lot of viewings where I've seen him not look like the best player on the ice, even in super elite where you'd expect that to be the case given his skill set. So he's a very talented player. He's, he's a crafty player with the puck on his stick. He can play through the middle of the ice. He can play in traffic. I like his ability to finish off plays and to, to potentially contribute on a power play and that kind of a thing. But at five foot 11, there has been worries for me when I've watched him play of, is he so talented enough that he's going to be able to, to sort of, become a top six or a middle six player because he's not going to be a, a fourth line guy. So there, there's a little bit of a risk in terms of a pick like that, especially with a, a player who, who just looks a little hesitant at times, which is a little disappointing, but the talent is there. And I think he's a fine pick there. The, the only of those three picks that I really had any real problem with was the Hannes pick. I, I feel like Hannes is more of a mid to late round guy for me. He projects as, as a third liner at the very best, and there's a raw quality to his game. I like the way that he forechecks. I like his constant energy. I like the way that he sort of attacks off the rush and, and tries to come at you in waves. But I don't think he's terribly talented. And I don't think he's going to take the big step next year that some believe he's going to take. There, there are people who think he could become one of the best players in junior hockey next year if, if everything goes well for him. And I just don't see that as, as a chance for him. I don't think his skill level is high enough. So he was the one player of those three that I would probably say was a bit of a reach for me, but he's still a fine prospect per se. I, I just don't think he's going to be more than a, a third or fourth line kind of energy guy who can chip in a little bit offensively. And that's not the kind of player that I like to target in the second round. So then uh, jumping to the third round where the Red Wings uh, tr uh, made a couple more picks, um, taking Donovan Sobrango and Emil Vero, a couple of left-handed defensemen, um, even after they took William Wallander. And most Red Wings fans identified this as a huge position of need. So uh, talk to us about who they are as players and then maybe touch on the fact that the Red Wings took three left-handed defensemen in such close succession. Yeah. If you think that's just them hedging their bets to make sure they hit on at least one of them. I think that's part of it. It could also, it, it, in, in a realistic case, they, those three kids may well have been, if not their best player available at that slot, then maybe two or three at that slot, in which case they, they made the decision to sort of stack up on the left side and, and hope for the best. Um, so I think that's probably a, a factor in, in, in each of those choices. The Sobrango pick is interesting to me. He's a kid who moves. I, I've said this all year, but he moves extremely well. And by moves, I mean, I don't mean that he's a, this sort of incredible skater or this sort of powerful skater. Uh, by movement, I mean off the puck, the, the lanes that he takes, the routes that he takes, the, the choices that he makes on sliding into space and sliding off the point and getting open. He always takes smart routes. And I think that's an underrated quality and something that we rarely focus on in player evaluation. And it's something that, that Sobrango does incredibly well. Like he's just smart out there in terms of when he doesn't have the puck, he knows where to go, how to get open. And though he, I wouldn't say he's terribly talented when he gets the puck back, the fact that he gets it in so many good spots just helps him make plays, even if he's not the most talented kid. So that's the the exciting part about Sobrango, I think. He's just a very sort of intelligent player in the way that he navigates offensively. And then defensively, he's an athletic kid. He's strong enough. He makes smart plays in his own zone on outlets, and he can advance the puck up ice, and he'll occasionally sort of step by a player and, and sort of get the rush started and that kind of a thing. He's not going to be a power play guy. I don't think you're going to see him take some monumental step offensively where he goes from being kind of a half a point per game player to a point per game defender next year in, in the OHL, assuming the OHL even happens, which isn't a guarantee at this point. And he, he's just a kind of well-rounded, versatile player. So we'll see. He's, he's the kind of kid where if he makes it, it'll be as a third-pairing guy. He's not going to be more than that. But I think you could see him as kind of a modern, no-fuss, kind of calculated, uh, modern player. Like that That's ultimately what he's going to be if he makes it. And I think that's a fine outcome if he becomes that type of, of option for you on the third-pairing. 
Vero is a tougher one. He, Vero was on my board very late, sort of in the 90s, whereas Sabrango was one of the final cuts for my top 100. But I'm not sold that Vero is even a, a significantly better prospect than Sabrango, per se. He's one of those kids who's been a little bit of a head scratcher for me. He turns some people into fans by virtue of just being beyond his age group his entire career like he played his entire season last year at the professional level most or most of it at least before kind of finishing in the playoffs at the junior level um he he was advanced in terms of his entry into the u20 level there uh, playing there as a 16 and a 17 year old um so that that part of vero's game has always intrigued people he has moved up the ranks i think a little too early in some cases i don't think he's talented enough to have made that leap to liga last year like he did um but it, people in his game people just see a kid who just always makes the right choice he's one of those defenders that you never really have to worry about and i think that is ultimately what propelled him up the ranks maybe over his actual athleticism or his actual skill set which i think are just kind of okay um but the fact that he's just a he's just a smart he's he's a lot, he's like a lot of those finnish defenders are he's just a smart heads up all the time, makes the quick eight foot pass every time, makes the smart choices across the offensive zone blue line, will occasionally join the rush to sort of go to the back door and and cr- try to get, sort of get open as a shot option in, in the offensive zone and that kind of a thing. But I don't think he's going to be a top of the lineup player. And I think he's been rushed a little bit too early and that that could impact his development. So Ultimately, he's just a kid who I think just does everything kind of at, a, at an above average level. And, and we'll see whether that's enough. Uh, he's, again, like like a Sabrango, I think you're probably looking at a third pairing sort of five, six, seven type defender if all goes well for him. And there's no guarantee that that's even going to happen. So uh, give him two or three more years in Liga to, to become a, a more controlled player, a more aggressive player. And then you kind of just go from there. So then without uh, diving too significantly into the remaining picks, because obviously anybody fourth round and beyond for the most part would be considering a long shot. So out of the remaining Infinity Red Wings picks, was there any picks that you really liked and any picks that really left you scratching your head? Well, pretty much all of them other than the Alex Cotton pick left me scratching my head a little bit. I um, I like Cotton. I, I think he can really shoot the puck. He's got a heavy, heavy point shot. His game has come a long, long way. Like his, He has made huge strides in the last year. Um, he, he's, he's sort of physical. He he's, can play without the puck positionally. Um, there's a lot to like about Cotton's game. I, I think he was a nice little pick. I, I don't remember exactly which pick they used on him, but Cotton's a player who I'm fond of. Outside of that, I mean, I don't have high expectations. All right, so... Overall, now that we've covered the Red Wings draft class, how would you uh, grade it? I know it's I'm not sure if you're a fan of that question, but if you had to assign Eisman and Draper a grade here, what would you give them? I think it's a B or a B plus. Um, I kind of do the the winners and losers format at, at the athletic where I break the each team's selections over the course of the two days down into kind of winners, overtime winners, overtime losers and losers. And I ha- had them in my overtime winners category, which is described as basically teams that maybe didn't pick the players that I would have picked or even the, the sort of five or six players at, at any of their selections that I would have picked, but teams that I think could ultimately still be happy with their choices when this is all over. So I wouldn't say that on day one or day two, they were among the five teams who I thought got the most value at, relative to where they picked. But I think they're in that sort of six to 10, six to 15 range. I think they had an above average draft class in terms of the picks that they'd assembled and the the outcomes that they had. And certainly there are two ways of looking at that. There's the relative outcome and then there's the total value outcome on total value. They've probably had one of the five best draft classes, but that's largely because a, they picked higher than most teams in every round and B because they had amassed a lot of picks. So um, I tend to prefer to look at it in, in relative terms. If a team only had three picks, but I felt they hit home runs on each of the three of them, I will still call them a winner. Even if none of those kids are, are going to become NHL players or they're a long shots to become NHL players, because I think it's all about value sort of relative to where you were slotted. And I think the, the Red Wings took a lot of players who were either on my board or in contention for my board. And I like that about what they did. 
But there were a couple of picks. The Cross Hannis pick comes to mind. Even the Emil Vero and, and Sobrango picks that were maybe a little bit too high for me. Um, and then I, the Raymond picks, great. I, I love the Raymond pick. I use, he was, that's it. I have absolutely no qualms there. So it was a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, I like the Wallander pick a lot. I, I, would, I would say on average, I would probably give them a B or a B plus. So then I'm going to ask you one very broad question before we finish it off. So now that this draft is in the books, we know the Red Wings are in the middle of a rebuild. Uh, Between the last three or four drafts, the Red Wings have amassed an incredible number of prospects. Yeah. Do you think with what they currently have in the system, they're in a position where we can reasonably expect the rebuild to start turning around essentially do they have enough in the system right now that we can expect them to be a we'll just say good team in three to five years i think so yeah um yeah absolutely i do they are they're i I wouldn't say they're the most well positioned there are still other teams that have better prospect pools the new york rangers have a better prospect pool the ottawa senators have a better prospect pool the carolina hurricanes and vegas golden knights i think have done a phenomenal job in recent years the philadelphia flyers are already a contending team and have a ridiculously talented prospect pool the colorado avalanche have a lot of talent coming so there are teams still that i think have better groups of prospects than the red wings if i were to do my prospect pool rankings which i do every february if I were to do them today, they may still not be in kind of the top five, uh, but they're in the conversation. They're they're kind of right in that mix. They have one of the better young groups coming in the NHL, and, and that's a testament to the job they've done both at the draft and in just obviously stockpiling, a, a, pardon my language, but a shit ton of picks. So um, they're, they're in a good spot now. Raymond gives them something that they lacked. Uh, Raymond gives them probably what they were, the, the kind of quality sort of star level prospect that they hoped that they were getting in Philip Zadina. And that's not to say I don't think Zadina is going to be a great player. I still think he's going to be a, a top six forward who can give you 25 goals a year. Um, but Raymond is that cut above. He's a cut above a more insider. He's, he's the clear best prospect in the organization now. And he gives you a potentially game changing talent if all goes well for him. So, um, that is a that's the big one for me. It's always the big picks that that define an organization. The you can get good depth further and down in the draft, but I think all this talk of you can find a Braden Point and you can find an Nikita Kucherov kind of gets away from you. Um, that just never it never happens, and it, I think it's going to start to happen less and less as teams get better at scouting and as more data becomes available and all of that. So um, we'll see. It, it, I think they're in a good spot. I, I do think that they have the pieces now where if Cider works out and if Raymond works out and if Zadina can become a contributing top of the lineup player for you uh, and Joe Valino can become a third line center for you and anti Misto might become a second pairing guy for you. And, th- and if those kinds of things start to happen, then suddenly you're in a really, really good spot. So uh, yeah, I think they'll get there in, in the next three, four years. Well, Scott, if you ever doubt that we uh, that we like you, just remember that we didn't ask you the who's the next Braden Point question. So <laughs> you're in our good books. Uh, yeah. Folks, this has been Scott Wheeler. Uh, Scott, so happy you could join us. Thank you for fitting this in. I know this came at the end of a long, long grind. Um, enjoy your well-deserved vacation. Uh, guys, if you want to read everything uh, that Scott has put together for this draft and that he's continuing to churn out because we think he's just a cyborg, um, go to the athletic uh he's worth the subscription alone um scott until next time i'm sure it won't be too long but enjoy your vacation yeah cheers guys thanks thanks for tuning in to the winged wheel podcast be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com where you can subscribe to the show on itunes spotify or wherever you get your podcasts you'll also find links to other ways to support the show such as patreon official podcast apparel and more and don't forget to follow the show on twitter at winged wheel pod and of course the hosts at brad crisco at ryan hannah wwp and at hockey town evan